they will cast a dark shadow over Heidegger's legacy. That's what the New York Review of Books wrote about Martin Heidegger's Black Notebooks. And it's to the Black Notebooks that I'd like to turn in the next few videos as a kind of introduction to Heidegger's thought through this unorthodox, controversial source of writings. I'm going to put my notes here up on screen so you can follow along with me if you'd like. Otherwise, let's just get started. The volume that will guide our discussions is published in English by Indiana University Press under the title Ponderings 2 to 6, Black Notebooks 1931-1938. As the translator's introduction tells us, 33 of the 34 Black Notebooks are extant. The published series begins with Ponderings 2, Ponderings 1 is the Lost Notebook. So we're beginning with the first of the available notebooks, our focus for this session. My intention in this introduction is to help you confront the questions that oriented Heidegger's thinking. We'll leave aside as much as possible questions about Heidegger's biography or about the historical details of this or that publication. We'll also leave aside for now the question of the reputation of the Black Notebooks, except for what I told you at the start, and of the impression they made on academic philosophers, journalists, and others in order to focus our attention on the text itself and through the text, on the questions. Heidegger himself did not want his readers to think about him, and he does not have doctrines as he sees it, but rather extended meditations, inquiries, and questions that he returned to repeatedly. As he writes, other tasks in philosophy besides the question posed there and being in time, even if at first only partially worked out, which is how he thinks that question was worked out in being in time, partially, the question of being, there is no other option except to write this book and only this book again and again. At the risk of becoming a person of one book, a homo unius libri, but beyond this unum, there is no aliad, no other. In other words, what Heidegger is saying here is, I have one question, the question of being, the question of the meaning of being, the question of the truth of being, the question of being. And all that I, Heidegger, can do is raise that question, return to that question, develop it in different ways. I don't have a doctrine of being. I'm not giving you an ideology of being. And you don't have to worry about my personal Heideggerian biography. All that matters in what I'm doing, Heidegger is saying, is pursuing the question of being. From one book to the next, beyond this one, there is no other. This one question that dominates his thinking. In the Contributions to Philosophy of the Event, there's a course in the Millerman School on that book, Heidegger writes the following, no one understands what I am here thinking. No one grasps this because others try to explain my attempt merely historiologically by appealing to the past which they believe they understand because it apparently already lies behind them. That means that for Heidegger, we can't understand what he's thinking by appealing to the past as past. Like you can't just compare, oh, in order to understand Heidegger, we should compare him with Kierkegaard. Or in order to understand Heidegger, we should see exactly the influences that he was working under. Like what book had he read two weeks before? No, that's an attempt to explain Heidegger historiologically with reference to the past as the set of things that happened before the present, the ordinary way of thinking about the past and the ordinary way of thinking about history and historical studies. Heidegger says you can't get onto his wavelength that way. Moreover, we shouldn't even be too quick to ascribe the thinking to him, because when we do that, we act as though we already know who Heidegger is and can determine him or define him adequately in his being. You see, he put I in quotation marks. No one understands what I am here thinking. Because what's at stake in his thinking is what it means to be an I, what it means to be human, who we are, the right way of understanding ourselves. So we shouldn't be too quick to ascribe the thinking to Heidegger. We already have some answer to the question, who is Heidegger? a 20th century philosopher, a world famous existentialist. You know, you could Google him and get a bunch of definitions about who he is. You can look him up in an encyclopedia and get a bunch of definitions about Heidegger. But we assume at the outset when we do that, that Heidegger is a philosopher. 
and that we know what that is. Philosophy. The activity of a rational animal, for instance. And we believe then that Heidegger's notebook is a record of thoughts that he had, of his considerations, opinions, hunches, reflections, and the like, which we'll read to learn about Mr. Heidegger the philosopher. You see, if we just take Heidegger as one among a number of philosophers, we take his writing and we call it philosophy. We read over his writing, we'll get a sense of his opinions, thoughts, arguments, ideas. We never put ourselves at stake in doing that in a fundamental way. But it's only when we do put ourselves at stake in a fundamental way that we actually enter the spirit of Heidegger's writing and thinking. So we must be prepared to abandon our assumptions about what philosophy is, what it means to philosophize, who Heidegger is, how to make sense of him, his relationship to the past, all of that. An introduction to Heidegger, understood from out of the essence of Heidegger's thought, can at best aim to place you in the position to transform your self-understanding and together with it, your understanding of what it is to be. Incidentally, Heidegger also strongly objected to the characterization of his thought as existentialist. So you might come to the text thinking, oh yeah, I know Heidegger, that existentialist philosopher. Well, no, Heidegger doesn't see himself like that. We have to be careful to try to see himself in his own way. We got to get on his wavelength, okay? And again, in the best case scenario, that means self-transformation, as we'll see. When Heidegger lectured to his students about the essence of truth on the basis of an interpretation of the allegory of the cave in Plato's Republic, here's what he said to them at the conclusion of his introductory remarks. Whether you are to understand our interpretation does not depend on whether you have a poor or non-existent understanding of Greek, also not on whether you have much or little understanding of philosophical doctrines, but only on whether you have yourselves experienced or are ready to experience a necessity to be here now, whether in this allegory something unavoidable speaks in and to you. Without this, he continues, all science remains outward show and all philosophy a facade, even if you knew the Greek really well, even if you knew the philosophical doctrines really well. If you lacked this experience and readiness to experience a kind of necessity in and through the philosophizing, it's all a facade. I want us to apply his comments to our introduction also. Whether you know Greek or German or not, and whether you have extensive knowledge of philosophical doctrines or not, is less important than whether you are ready to experience in Heidegger's questions something unavoidable that speaks in you and to you. Let's now turn to the notebooks.